I just wanted to introduce you to Brad. Uh, he's uh, a friend of a former Googler manager of mine, and we connected. Um, Brad has worked in the technology space, but has a background in the liberal arts space. So kind of got roped in, became a coder, and has been doing all sorts of um, great projects since then. Uh, he's coming back to his roots in terms of this liberal arts and, and wrote this book. It has a technology slant in it, so um, kind of really applicable to us. Uh, something I, I read recently of Brad's, he did this op-ed in New York Times about um, how technology and art and the humanities really need to go together for uh, successful outcomes. I think at Google we talk about how diversity is important, and we think of diversity in terms of male, female, uh, different backgrounds, um, but certainly uh, one of the kind of diverse backgrounds we can think about at Google is this idea of not just I grew up, learned a lot of math, started, got a CS degree and came to Google, but maybe there's different ways people can get, through, get to Google and provide good computer science without necessarily that CS degree. And uh, hopefully we can ask some, Brad some questions about that. Um, uh, so without further ado, I'd like to give the time over to Brad. Thank you. Thanks, Joel. Thank you all for, for coming. Thanks for your patience. Um, so I'm going to, uh, the good news is I won't be reading from an op-ed. I'm going to be reading straight fiction. So you can close your eyes, hopefully get somewhat absorbed in the story. Um, as Joel said, I um, one of the, I guess, animating uh, ideas for me for this book, uh, which is called The Adventurist, I guess I'm supposed to, should I hold it up and plug it properly, uh, is, um, is the fact that uh, in a lot of the reading I had done, uh, I did not see much in literature that um, really made much in the way of attempting to depict the work worlds that many of us, certainly in this room, but you know, <laughs> collectively as a country, uh, inhabit. I think by and large, sort of the work world is usually depicted satirically, um, which is funny and, and fun. Um, but it's obviously also a very flattening lens. Um, so one of the things that interested me, not the only thing with the novel, but one of the things that interested me was, what would it be like if you attempted to write a book that actually took the work world seriously? Um, not in the sense that you didn't find things to gently poke fun at, um, but that you actually recognize the fact that you know, a lot of us come to work in offices like these, actually not usually this good, but in offices similar to these, um, and we find a range of experiences. We, we find experiences that are both affirmative, we, you know, we're, we're applauded for our innovation and our work, and, and we also find conflict and rivalry. We may find crushes. Um, I think the full range of human emotion does occur inside, inside the work world, inside these offices, even though that's not typically, at least in popular culture terms, the way it's reflected. So that, as I say, that was an animating idea. When I was thinking last night about what to read out of the book here, uh, I, I was wrestling a little bit, and I wound up gravitating towards some of the earlier scenes where sort of the work environment is being anchored. And I thought to myself, that's a great idea. And then when I showed up, I'm like, you know, these folks have stepped out of the work environment to have a break, and now I'm going like, to read something that may <laughs> thrust them right back into it. But let's give it a shot. I'm not going to read for too long, sort of 10, 15 minutes. And then if there are questions about the book or, as Joel said, you know, anything else you want to talk about, uh, we, can, we can do that. And I'm also happy to inscribe books if, if folks are interested. Um, I've taken a slight liberty. I'm going to concatenate two scenes here. So um, the way I'll read it is not precisely the way it flows in the book, but that's not really material to you. Okay. So this is, uh, this is the adventurist. There are three characters you care about. The narrator's name is Henry. Uh, the uh, person that's going to show up the most in the scene with him is a guy named Barry. Barry heads up sales. Henry, the narrator, uh, heads up engineering. Uh, they work for a company called Cyber, um, which, as you see, is having some struggles. Uh, and the only other name, I think, that isn't introduced here is a guy by the name of Keith. Uh, and he's the general manager. They work for Keith. So Henry narrator, Barry head of sales, Keith the boss. The Monday management meeting. There are five of us, department heads each, sales, marketing, engineering, operations, finance. There's also Keith. We report to him. It is his meeting. 
I'm aware that nothing conjures the tedium of business so much as a weekly meeting. And it is true, we deliver our reports in the most nickel-plated of monotones. The worst you can do here is to insist. We are, we are authoritative by our very bloodlessness. Yet the truth is, I crave these sessions. Here, commercial necessities are turned to concrete actions with measurements and owners and due dates, and there's no Paul to speak of. Barry is last to present. He concludes his report by saying he remains pleased with the pipeline. Keith flips the few pages of the sales report with a sour look. You're pleased with the pipeline, he says finally. The pipeline is a list of sales prospects and dollar values, along with the percentage chance of our winning the deal. Well, I am pleased you're pleased. Barry shakes his head and gives the table a vaudevillian look. I know I said this for a couple weeks, but if some of these don't hit next week, some chuckle supportively. Keith does not. Then what? Sorry? If some of these don't hit next week, then what? Well, then I should look for a new head of sales? Ha, uh, no. Keith waits, an ear cocked in Barry's direction. In these meetings, the role of listener also carries with it certain affectations. Eyes narrowed, legs crossed, pen to lips, the occasional nod or frown, the corporate world's skeptical punctuation. None of which applies to Keith. Keith doesn't go for affectation. I feel excellent about these, Keith. Maybe not the ones listed at 20% probability, but these 60 and above ones, who boy. That's two. Two opportunities at 60%. What's your revenue target? Right at 15 for the quarter. Four. Four million dollars. What's the total value of these two? Assuming we get them, which I most certainly am not. One million. One million? It's not even that much, friend. Not according to this. You've got 750 here. 500,000 for Marcatel, 250 for Delta. Any deal north of a million is still sitting in sub-20 probability, which means we have what? Two? Three quarters of coaxing ahead of us for any of those? Best case? Barry's phone buzzes in its holster. He consults it seriously, hopefully. OK, he says, all right, let's take these one at a time, focus on the birds in hand. Marcatel, it's the biggest of the 60% probabilities. You see them this week? Thursday, Barry affirms. Talk to us about the strategy. Having pressed him, Keith will back off. It is important that Barry leave on a note of confidence. Buyers can smell panic on a salesman. Well, I've got a new contact there. My old guy was bumped. Uh-oh, says Keith, but not without sympathy. No, it might could work in our favor. The G2 I have on this new guy is that he's pretty respected. He could probably move things quick. What do we know about him? Not a ton. He's from the inside. I know that. I don't have to re-educate him on who we are. Good. No lost ground. He's from inside the company. What group? Uh, engineering, I think. 90% sure. A tech guy. OK, take Henry with you. Barry nods energetically, as though he were about to propose just this. But what he says is, yes, although I'm thinking on this one, since I haven't met this guy myself yet, I fly solo, build a relationship, then bring in a heavy hitter like Henry. He means he doesn't want to share credit if the deal closes. I don't blame him. It's not my desire to go along in any case. Business travel no longer suits me. An ominous glow comes into Keith's face. Through sheer professional will, he appears to consider Barry's plan. Then he says, no, no time. We need to hit this guy with everything we've got in this week. Agree 100%. My only thing is, I don't want to scare the guy off, you know? He hasn't even met me, and all of a sudden, I'm up there with an army of folks. Not an army, one other person. Our director of engineering, which shows how much we value his time. We're sparing two of our directors. Yep, the only other thing, because our situation, Barry, Keith interrupts, his temper slipping again. Our situation is this. It's January 12th. We have about 10 weeks to get to 4 million. He catches himself, nods, addresses the table. And we'll do it, no question, but we don't have a lot of room. Marcatel's key. Barry's done a great job priming them. Here, Barry studies his lap modestly. And the deal's worth half a million, so we'd be a good ways along. And I think we'll nail it, Barry adds, though he's distracted again by his phone and is tapping away, even as he says this. This is too much. Keith sets a careful hand on the table. Barry, next week, I want to hear what you know. 
what you have made happen, not what you fucking think. He slapped shut his portfolio and his first out of the room. There is a brief, even apologetic clearing of throats. People rise and file out. Barry touches a hand to my sleeve. He shuts the door behind the last person, ducking his head to scan the terrain through the room's low portal windows. Satisfied the hall is free of spies, he faces me. That guy, Keith. Keith, yes, I mean, sometimes he gets to you, you know? He'll catch twice as much hell when he delivers his report. Oh, I know, I know, Barry replies quickly. He is silent for a moment, nodding his agreement while pacing a tight circle. He's tucked his hands in the pockets of his trousers so that the thumbs remain exposed. It is an unnatural stance. He has to stiffen at the elbow, elbows to hold it. A lawyer delivering impassioned closing to skeptical jury. The poor bastard. He might have waited to make his point, though. Exactly. That's exactly it. I'm not saying he's wrong. I'm on the hook here. No two ways about it. But in front of everyone else, that's what gets me. That's all I'm saying. And then you get dragged along, which I'm sorry about that. He wags his head and sighs. It just makes you wonder, you know, this place, whether it's all worth it? Ah, but already he is recovering. I know that sigh. In it is captured the entire American romance of moving forward, moving on, a job well done, or not well done, or not done at all, never mind. Turn the page, a blank sheet, a fresh start, and this time, yes, Barry is a true wax and waner. Whatever his dejections now, it will not last the week. Sunday morning will come again. The sales call is a disaster from top to bottom. For starters, there is the weather. A warm front has heaved north from the Gulf and rolled the landscape under fathoms of invection fog. Marcatel, their customer going to visit, is in Minneapolis, and they're, they're based in the south. In the gloom, we miss an exit and carry on for a full 20 minutes before realizing our mistake. When finally we arrive at the Marcatel offices, Barry is in a state. He leaps from the rental car and is nearly across the parking lot before remembering his portfolio. I wait by the entrance. The building is part of a newly tilled office park near the Mall of America. A long, two-story brick affair, its architecture is as square and utilitarian as boxcars. There is little to inspire in these office parks, yet the companies they house are usually as stolid and profitable as banks. Sponges for every bit of available local talent and run by top graduates of the state's best public university. Some of the most frank, rooted people I've met, people who've never in their lives coveted a more epic context, go gladly to work each day in these anonymous pillboxes. I envy them. Barry returns with portfolio. He is wired even by his own electric standard. Let's hit it. Our contact is waiting at the security desk. His wide face burns with cheeriness. You're the cyber guys. He extends a hand. Mike Cottrell, I'm the new sheriff, I guess. Barry clasps his arm and snaps it like a well pump. Glad to put a face to the name. This is my associate, Henry. He directs our engineering group. We brought all the big guns. Mike is perhaps 40. He carries a sort of pregnant girth in his belt, slung over a pair of creaseless trousers. His loafers are stained with road salt. I am tempted to read in this mild sloppiness a genial spirit, but there is a beady eyedness that puts me on my guard. Mike, I'm sorry about the time, Barry says. The usual travel hiccups, I'm afraid. Our host lets drop my hand and turns to face Barry directly. His movements are oddly sedate. Hard stop at 11. Oh, I thought, could have sworn we booked through lunch. Eleven. His tone is mild, even benevolent. You guys were any later. I would have canceled. We follow Mike to a conference room on the second floor. It is a narrow, hall-like chamber, featureless but for a bank of slatted windows. The carpet is gray. An immense oval table commands the floor. This is a room built to vet vendors, I know. Solemnity is its point, but someone has made a mistake. The screws have been turned a little too tight. With its mass slab table in grim colors, its narrow dimensions and hyperbaric air, the seriousness of the room is in danger of turning over on itself. It is very nearly hilarious. Four other men are clustered at one end. Each is introduced somberly as one kind of specialist or another. When we are acquainted and seated, Mike nods to Barry 
Barry hops from his seat to begin. My apologies all around for the delay. I'll get straight in because I know our time's limited. Can we skip all the song and dance on Cyber's background and standing as a company? Everyone's nodding yes. All right. So we'll start with the technical portion, my colleague Henry's portion. We can circle back for any more general questions. So I'll just dim the lights and the switches. Where? Here. Yes. Henry? It is a part of the job, a day out to help sales make pitches of a certain type, often to large, cynical prospects who want to see and hear from the person whose team will make sure the software behaves. And once the oddness of arrival and introduction is passed, I find it's a job I can do. I like to explain our technologies. Even the idioms of our science appeal to me. Wedding cakes, fish bones, bit rot. And usually among other engineers, I'll encounter a shared interest, an appreciation, at the least, for the decisions we've made, for the strategies we studied and rejected, and the reasons for their dismissal. Only today what I find is silence. Mike studies the table. The others regard my slides with the waxen look of actors feigning death. I can see nothing to do but press on. Barry, however, is itchy. After several slides, he begins to hear interjections in a cleared throat. Mark, you had a question? Our host looks up from the table. There's a moment's confusion. He folds his arms and squints at Barry. Are you speaking to me? Yes. Mike. Mike, forgive me. You had a question? No. I thought you looked like you did. You'll know if I have a question. Of course. The best sales pitch I ever heard about was made by a cyber competitor. It was told to me by the salesman himself, whom I met one evening at a conference in Washington. He told me about a sale he'd once made to the Central Intelligence Agency. As jaded and bored an audience as you could ever hope to find, there is nothing but nothing a mere salesman could tell the CIA about security. But he became suddenly inclined to buy when it was revealed that the salesman's analyst, pounding away on a keyboard at the back of the room, had contrived to deface the agency website and the time it took to pass around the coffee. But here, there are only mannequin faces in the gloom. The minutes drip. When I am finished, Barry stands and raises the lights. He smacks his hands together, rubbing them and making a slight bow to our host. Mike remains as he has throughout, absorbed by the area of the table in front of him. So, Mark, Barry prompts, now what are your questions? We are lost. This emphasis on name is meant to show he's taken special care to get it right. Except because he has fumbled the name again, the effect is opposite. It seems he's making some bizarre point of defiance. Mike says nothing. He stares at the table, his arms crossed heavily over belly, a forelock of hair drops onto his eyebrow. He smooths it into place with his ring and pinky fingers. The gesture is ominously dainty, bottled. Barry sees his mistake. Mike, Mike, what is wrong with me today? Our host picks microscopic lint from his trousers. I don't know. What is wrong with you today? The question is posed offhandedly, almost kindly. It is possible to imagine he's as curious in the answer as Barry. It's the cold, Barry cries. Us Southerners don't do well in the snow. Our brains freeze. Mike leaps from his chair and thrusts out a hand. I want to thank you. He is grinning, shaking Barry's arm, a revealing presentation. Guys, am I wrong? His team swaps private glances. Mike calls to one of them. Tom, what was your favorite part? Silence. Mike leers at the group. His eyes pop with goodwilled expectancy. One of the men clears his throat. Tim, I think you mean. Tim, yes. He throws back his head in marvel. How stupid of me. Goddamn brainless. You're critical to our business here, so do not get your name right. I feel like a turd. Tim smiles uncomfortably. Mike paces to the window. There he stands, nodding, tapping his lip. I wouldn't be surprised, Tim, if you wanted to walk, ra walk right out of here, never talk to me again. Wouldn't blame you a bit. Quality and everything. That's what we preach, so the least you'd expect is that I could remember your name, no? Yes. Absolutely right. He turns to Barry, whose face has gone bland and waxy. Safe travels, friend. In the stairwell, Barry pulls off his spectacles and digs at his eyes with thumb and forefinger. Barry, <clears throat> the man is certifiable, forget it. No. Barry replaces his frames, blinking at me through glass. We don't talk about customers that way. So this is how he will have it. His dignity will be restored by lesson giving. As engineer, I misunderstand the dynamics of selling. It falls to him to show how the licking just received is, in fact, small sacrifice for fealty to the high cause of customer service. 
It's no small alchemy to turn a humiliating episode into a business lesson with Barry as a master of subtleties that my poor nuts and bolts brain has missed. Having been condescended to, Barry would condescend. And if I were a bigger person, I might allow him his pose of sensei, might sit as apprentice while Barry lectures himself back to level. A smart thing where cyber is concerned because a salesman with doubts is like a prostitute with inhibitions, only getting their names wrong. That's how we speak about our customers. He glares. By the way, thanks for the assist. Really tremendous. Just sit there while I get, even when he's angry, cursing comes hard to Barry. Screwed up the rear. Big help. Your problem, Henry, if you want to know, is you always think discretion is the better part of valor. Nothing useful can come of this. When at last we part company, I'm glad to be rid of him. Thank you all. Um, it seems like sort of recently there's been an uptick in the number of books that are written about people at work who aren't, you know, detectives or soldiers or something. Um, <laughs> no vampires. Yeah, right. Uh, at their jobs. Do you think that, uh, well, do you think that there's a particular reason for this? And do you think it has anything to do with the fact that it seems like today it's harder than ever to make a living just as a writer? So maybe more people are working at regular jobs? It could be connected to both. I don't, I don't, you guys probably have the data. I don't have the data on how many works of literature actually now attempt to, attempt to do anything with, with what we would sort of commonly call the work world. Um, it still seems to be pretty thin on the ground. But by the same token, I think the reality is, you know, almost every writer you've ever heard of had a day job. Uh, there's, you know, you probably count on one hand the number of writers uh, that don't have uh, other means of income. I think the difference, of course, is that maybe traditionally those day jobs were academic. Um, I don't know how many campus novels we saw in the, you know, the 50s and 60s. Um, and it may be simply that you're right, that we're beginning to sort of transition out of that period and that writers, probably for the better, for the work anyway, uh, are finding themselves with more, more diverse and different positions. But, but the other thing I will say is, um, and maybe, maybe if people are waking up to this, I don't know, but um, I said elsewhere, and I, this sounds like hyperbole, but I mean it. I think um, after the battlefield, the work environment has the richest set of human drama you're gonna find. Um, and that's, I think, for a variety of reasons, but one of the big reasons is, like a battlefield, we're all thrust together. We don't necessarily have much say over who our coworkers are. Uh, and that's going to lead to all kinds of interesting things, both positive and negative. So I think it's a, it winds up being an environment rich in fictional possibilities. Um, if you see it that way, uh, this is a little bit my slight soapbox remarks about the satirical view that people take. That's such a, um, <clears throat> it's such a failure of imagination, ultimately. It's such a flattening way to think about what we do. Um, that I think if you don't think about it that way, the fictional possibilities are everywhere. So it's a good question. Uh, I was just wondering if you had like a favorite quotation that you've ever written, and like when you reread it, you're like, wow. Oh, that really I personally have written? Yeah. Oh, that's a great question. Um, do I have a favorite quotation that I've ever written? I have hundreds. Uh, no, let me. I would. I would have to. Um, I would have to think about that. There's one. Uh, this is shameless. People are going to think I planted you in the audience to ask that question. Um, there, there, there was one. There's one in this book. Um, uh, I don't. Maybe I can find it as we're as I'm sort of fumbling along. Um, maybe I won't because I've just put a lot of pressure on myself, and it's got to be something amazing given the question you ask. A, a broader answer is yes. There are there are certain phrases that are in the book that stick with me because I think as a writer, um, I don't know if other folks in the room are writers, but but the condition of a writer generally <coughs> is. Um, you spend most of your days in agony uh, with things not working uh, and looking terrible and basically thinking and feeling like you're a fraud. And so, but from time to time, you have a moment where you connect to something and it comes out and the words arrange themselves the way they need to be arranged. And it speaks to a sentiment or an experience that you don't think is commonly spoken to. Uh, and when that happens, it's just a little moment of catching lightning in a bottle. Um, and so, yes, there are several of those. Not lots and lots, but, but several. Thank you, for, thank you for that question. I don't know what other people's experience coming to work is, but my own experience is that the, the percentage of my personality that comes out in the work world is rather small relative to what could come out in the rest of my life. Was that challenging for you to create 
fully three-dimensional characters in this, uh, in this setting? Maybe. Um, so one, general observations, I agree with you. I think um, it, it, it sounds like a negative thing, but we almost have to live these bifurcated <laughs> existences. I mean, there's, there's one mask we're going to don when we come into this space, and it's, you know, that sounds terrible, but the reality is we just, we have to kind of get together and, and, you know, work hard and, and go along to get along, even if we don't feel like it or we've had a horrendous, you know, night before, whatever the case may be. So I, I agree with that. Um, what the possibility that introduces, um, I think in this book, particularly for the narrator, is that that begins to exert a particular pressure on him because he has been a person, like many of his coworkers, who is, you know, pragmatic and rational and level-headed and well-adjusted. And but there is uh, pressure from his personal life in this book. And a large part of the book is what happens when that pressure becomes, you know, greater than maybe he can sort of contain in that work-oriented mindset. Um, but you're right. I mean, the flip side is uh, if you're going to set a book uh, in the workspace and you're not going to make it a satirical one, you want to make it largely realist, you're right. There are going to be certain constraints. You're not going to have people going into operatic crying fits or doing other things unless, you, you know, you're presenting characters that are, that are mentally disturbed. Um, but I would say, I, maybe this is true, maybe it isn't. I, I certainly can't make any claims from my own writing. But I think even in scenes like that short one we read, there's clear tension both on the surface and below the surface that's occurring. Um, even though people are largely polite. Keith has that one slight outburst at the end. But, but you know, people are largely polite. And I think it's the fact that you sort of are trying to keep a lid on that politeness, even when underneath you may feel anything but. Um, that, that by itself is sufficient tension to, to drive parts of the story. Um, but it is a good question. You, you have certain creative constraints if you're going to say it's a work story. There are certain ways people can behave and certain ways they can't behave. Um, so it's a good question. Uh, uh, the question I have is, can you briefly describe your uh, creative process? You know, what kind of sparked the idea and how do you build out an outline or an audio uh, get to a final product? Yes. I don't know if I can briefly describe the creative process. Um, I, as I had mentioned, I was um, uh, when I had been working for about ten years uh, uh, when I decided I wanted to try to write. Uh, so I had not. I feel as though a lot of writers kind of know out of the gates that that's what they want to do, and you know they start in their teens or early twenties, and they kind of go heads down. And, and so I was at least ten years delayed on that. Um, I would like to say now productively so, because I think that gives you time not only to live your life, um, but also just to let certain experiences build. Uh, that's different from saying you have any sort of wisdom, but you've lived enough things to sort of know what happens. And as I say, one of the things that, that I was drawn to was I was doing a lot of reading, you know, as, as, as a, you know, obviously like all of us, right? You work your day job and then you go home and, and do what you do. And one of the big things I did was, was read. Um, and as I say, I was just struck by the fact that um, there's just almost no literature that actually, you know, looks at the work, workplace. So that was, a, that was absolutely a trigger point um, for, for thinking about it. Um, but to be a little bit more, I guess, you know, practical or pragmatic, um, I also realized at that time, even if I had this sort of inchoate idea, um, that it was going to take a lot of time to really try to do it. Um, and so I, I left my job and I went and uh, got a master's in fine arts, which is really just, you know, it's like apprenticing yourself to other writers, right? I mean, before the MFA programs existed, you know, Hemingway had all his crew in Paris and he could just apprentice to them. I think MFA programs today are, are our apprentice programs. Um, and what you discover in that process is that um, you just don't know what you don't know uh, as, a, as a, somebody who would be a writer. Um, and a huge part of that is, is writing and developing an allergy to what you write and then beginning to develop the vocabulary to understand why what you write is so awful. Uh, and, and again, beginning to understand what it might look like if it weren't so awful. Um, so I, there's, no, there's no simple answer. There was the idea. It nagged at me enough. It didn't go away. It wasn't like I had the study for a couple weeks and then it just faded. The idea sort of sat there. And then I finally decided, well, I need to do something with this idea. And that's where the practical, pragmatic part of you kicks in, right? What would it mean to go do something with this? Getting up in the mornings, writing on the side isn't enough, because I need people who know what they're doing to look at it. And so in my case, that meant 
taken the, taken the subsequent steps. We'll see what happens in the next book. Fresh on my mind is um, your op-ed about uh, technology and humanities um, being necessary to advance both, I think. Uh, certainly advanced technology. And um, I, think, I think we kind of all live insulated. We live in this tech bubble. We talk, talk about it as a tech bubble, right? And, um, and one of the things I heard from a different meeting this morning was about the Brexit and how a lot of people are, uh, a lot of people are feeling left behind in this new economy and maybe even our, our culture. Um, do you think technology has a lot to do with what's going on politically in terms of people feeling left out? I mean, I look at my parents and my, you know, my dad wants to sometimes throw his phone against the wall. He's like, I don't know how to answer this thing, right? Is that is that part of the problem? That I uh, I'm going to regret saying that talk, but I think because you've now put a Brexit question in it, I'm going to be really stumped. No, let me <laughs> let me let me fumble my way through because I I think. Um, if I were to go back to the short, the short answer is: is technology is it is it um, you know if you will flattening things for folks, or is it actually a distancing thing? Is it is it making the elites higher and everyone else left behind? The short answer is: I don't know. I can see an argument either way. But what I what I would say, and this was part of the reason that I that I wound up writing the, the, that that particular op-ed piece, is um, I guess I I don't think resent is too strong a word, but I, I resist or resent the idea that. Um, this, this push that, that, that is on right now, which is to basically say, look, we need to throw out the humanities because it has no uh, vocational merit. And we have to get all our you know, 15, 16, and 17 year olds just to study engineering. To me, is, um, it's misguided for a couple reasons. First of all, it feels as though we're trying to create some sort of high priest class, and the only way to get into that class is if, if, you, you, know, if, if, you, if you know what bits are. But, but more broadly, my feeling is that's just a fundamental misunderstanding of software. Um, and folks are obviously feel free to disagree with this, but my assertion is that software is more creative as an activity than it is algorithmic. That's more or less the point I was trying to make. This notion that it's all about the bit heads and it's just about these engineering kind of geeks and that's just, I think, fundamentally misguided. It does not correspond with my own experience. The best developers I've worked with, uh, and I'm a far cry from these folks, but the best developers I've worked with are fundamentally creative souls. Um, and uh, you know, it was only coincidental whether they'd actually been born and bred in engineering. Uh, they were philosophy majors and music majors and folks that had come out of these, these artistic degrees. So that's, I, I realize that's a little adjacent to the question you're asking, which is, is technology sort of, um, you know, is it making better or worse, this feeling that we're separating? And I, I'm not, as I say, I'm not sure of the answer, but, but the one thing I do feel strongly about is our desire to say there's only one true path to become, you know, effective in technology. And if you're not on that true path, you might as well just, you know, I don't know, go open an apple cart. Um, to me, that just is, is totally misguided and it doesn't make any sense. And maybe if, you know, <laughs> A, if I'm right, and if people wake up to that, then maybe fewer people feel sort of excluded and feel like, well, okay, this is something I can tackle. Um, I mean, again, I don't, I don't know if it's controversial, but you know, learning learning the program is it's 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 learning a language fundamentally, um, and lots of people are capable of learning a language. Now, you know, obviously the best developers do more than that, but um, but this idea that it's this thing for this very select few, it doesn't feel right, and it's probably not good for us on a macroeconomic level either. There's a pretty good sized collection, uh, a population of writers at, uh, at Google. They have day jobs, of course. They always ask this, what's your advice? <laughs> Keep your day job is, is, my, is, is my advice. I, yeah, I, 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 I think uh, maybe I'll be singing a different song five years from now, but I, I think um, unless your job is, I mean, with this, at least this cohort, I feel comfortable saying we're not coal miners. Um, you know, we, we have it reasonably easy, not to say our jobs aren't stressful, but, um, and as long as you feel as though the job can be contained, if, if, if it's not bleeding you dry and, and leaving you with sort of nothing left over <laughs> to do anything else, in which case you'd probably be looking regardless of whether you're a writer or not. But I think as long as it can be contained, then I think it can be productive um, because, uh, as I say, it puts you in it puts you uh, into encounter with folks that you don't otherwise necessarily choose to be encounter with. And some writer, I can't remember uh, which one said this, but had this great phrase. He said, P 
people come to you dripping in mystery, which I think is a great way, it may be a slightly vampiric way to look at people if you're a writer, but the, it's true that, that everyone comes with his or her own story, everyone has genuinely fascinating experiences, and as a writer, you want your radar up and attuned to those kinds of things. It, it's kind of what in, informs a lot of what you're after, at least a lot of what I'm after in a book, which is to, to try to make sense of my own life and to try to see existence as I've lived it depicted in a, in a credible and real way. And I think if you, I don't know what the magic utopia some writers think exists, if it's to shut yourself up in kind of a tower and never have to do anything other than work, you know, I'm afraid ultimately that's going to come through in, in the writing itself. It's going to start to feel very hermetically sealed and sterile and chilly, whatever other adjective you might come up with. So that's my plug for the value of, of having to get up and, and work something that is not related to your writing. As I say, give, give me another five years, I may be ground down to nothing, and I'll give you a very resentful different answer, but that's my answer right now. Thank you all very much. Really appreciate you coming. <laughs>